because this concerns the kingdom of God. And what's fascinating is how Mark puts this. Do you notice that every time that Jesus calls someone, the word used there is immediately. Jesus demands immediate and unreserved followership. That's what he demands. You see, think about this in contrast, and this is what Mark wants us to see. Mark is saying to us, John came preaching a gospel of repentance. And when he looked at people, the Jews and the Gentiles, those who were part of the covenant community and those who were not part of the covenant community, and he said to them, I want you to repent and to be baptized. No one argued with John. No one came to John and says, what do you mean be baptized, John? I'm a Jew. I'm a Pharisee. No, they didn't. And John is saying, the one who comes after me is greater than I. I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie the sandals that he's wearing. I baptize you with water, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I can only bring you to the door of his presence. He is the one who's going to grant you the privilege of being in his presence and will evidence that by giving you the Holy Spirit. If you have heard it so far carefully, there's only one conclusion you can come to. If listening to what John said was a non-negotiable, what does that make of listening? You see, Jesus demands immediate and unreserved followership. The message of the gospel of Jesus must not be divorced from his invitation to follow him. To repent of our sins and believe in the gospel means we will now follow Jesus in everything without delay or reservations. If God has broken into human history for your sake and mine, if as Luke would put it, quoting Isaiah, people seated in darkness have seen a great light, if that is the whole endeavor, the quest of what God is in doing in our behalf. And if that's the gospel, and if that's what Jesus Christ came to both announce and accomplish, then you cannot separate the message of what the gospel is from the demands of what the gospel places on our lives. The message of the gospel of Jesus Christ must not be divorced from the invitation that he has offered, extended to follow him. And so to repent of our sins and to believe in the gospel means we will now follow Jesus in everything or without reservations or delay. Which brings us to the next question. Why Jesus? Why follow Jesus? We'll take a break of 10 minutes and then come back. And then we'll answer the question, why follow Jesus? Uh, have not looked at your notes open ended like this. Your the outline that I'm using is on your right hand side, just in case. Uh, so most of what I have on the slides are already there, but some of them, if you'd like to make your own notes, under like this, this is a space for you to scribble. So feel free to, to do that. <laughs> So the question that we need now to ask uh, and answer is, why should we follow Jesus? Right? Because if uh, the message, the invitation is to repent from the kind of life we used to live and turn and follow Jesus, why should you do that? Why should you follow Jesus? And what follows from this point forward is Mark gives you a series of reasons why. Now the way Mark writes is that he 
theologically constructs his arguments. He's not giving you a chronology of, or a sequence of events. He's not saying this happened first, then this happened next, then this followed. No, that's not what Mark, Mark is doing. Because Jesus kept going in and out. And if you read the Gospels, if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you'll find that Jesus goes from one place to another, then he goes back, then he comes back. So there's several things happen every time Jesus goes in and out of a place. Now Mark is not interested in telling you all that happens. He's just using a sequence which says, okay, he begins in, in Galilee and then he goes beyond Galilee, then he goes towards Jerusalem and then he goes into Jerusalem and then he's put on the cross outside Jerusalem. That's, that's Mark's flow. But all along he's using that information. He's not making up information, but he's using that information to argue a particular case. And the case he's arguing is a case for Jesus. So why should we follow Jesus? And you will see this. The first thing that he brings to our attention is the kind of authority Jesus exercises. Now Jesus taught with authority in the synagogue and on the Sabbath. Here's what you read in verse 21 and 22 of chapter 1. And they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. We are not told what he teaches. But those who listened to him, they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one, please note, who had authority and not the scribes. Or oh, the scribes had authority over the people. So what Mark is saying is that Jesus is exercising a very different kind of authority. Jesus was teaching people about the kingdom of God, and when he stood up and he spoke, or when he sat down and he taught, people were gripped by what he was saying and the manner in which he said it. Why? Because he was teaching them as someone who had authority. So you see that Jesus was someone who taught them with, uh, with authority, but it doesn't stop there. The next thing that Mark lays for us to consider is not just the authority that he taught with, but he had authority over demons and the supernatural world. Listen to what he says in verse 23 and following. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. This is very interesting. They are still in the synagogue. We can have people with unclean spirits in synagogues and churches. <laughs> no. Let's not be distracted here. Immediately there was a, in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him, crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And here's what the people, oh this, here's how they respond. And they were all amazed. And so they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him and at once his fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. You see Jesus not only had authority in the way he taught, he had authority over the demonic world, over the supernatural. Why follow Jesus? Oh Mark doesn't stop there, he continues. He has authority over disease and physical ailments. Look at what he says in verse 29 and following. And immediately they left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a fever. And immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand. He lifted her up and the fever left her. And she began to serve him. The evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick and were oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door and he healed many who were sick and with various diseases and cast out many demons and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Now why follow Jesus? Because he has authority over demons and interestingly he has authority over what he does. Now in spite of all this success in ministry what was Jesus actually looking for? What was his motive? Why should you follow Jesus? 
verse 35. Mark continues, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus departed and went out into a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let's go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also. For that is why I came out. And he went throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. You see, Jesus is the only person who is more interested in going and seeking for the lost than for the lost to be found. Why follow Jesus? Because Jesus had authority over his work and ministry. His motive was not tainted by his popularity. Mark doesn't stop there. Why follow Jesus? Because he had authority over all that defiled humans. Remember, Jesus is a Jew. And by Jewish law and custom, if someone had a skin disease, leprosy was a common term for any kind of skin disease, it demonstrated visibly that you are a defiled person. Now, if you are a defiled person, you have no place in the company of God and His people. You need to be put outside the camp, as it were. And you are literally not permitted to touch anyone. No one is permitted to touch you. Till you are rid of your defilement. And then you have to go and show proof that you have been rid of your defilement. And only then are you welcome in fellowship again. Now there was a leper who came to him, imploring Jesus, kneeling and said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. You see, people knew about Jesus. They even understood his motive was that he was going to seek and save the lost. But Mark cannot stop there. He has to give you a much more grander and a much more bigger picture of Jesus for you to appreciate why you must follow Jesus. Why? Because he wants to tell you that you cannot live life on your own terms. You have to turn away, you have to repent and turn to Jesus. And why should you follow Jesus? Because he has authority over all that defiles you. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and he touched him. And he said to him, I will be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. What is fascinating over here is, did Jesus have to touch him? Why did he touch him? Because he wanted to show you and me that what you and I are defiled by is not going to taint him. And he is not going to step aside and let you live in that which defiles you. Only he can reach out, and he did reach out. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priests and offer your cleansing of what Moses commanded for proof to them. But this man went out and began to talk freely about it. And he spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter town, but went out in a desolate place and people were coming to him from every quarter. The reason why Jesus became popular was people couldn't stop talking about him. And the reason why Jesus today is not popular is people do not want to talk about him. Why should you follow Jesus? Well, you and I can follow Jesus with confidence because Jesus not only taught with uncommon authority, Jesus had authority over the demons, over death, over disease, and over all that defiles. That's why you can follow Jesus. Anything that your life encounters, Jesus has overcome. That's why you can follow Jesus. You don't have to pick and choose and go from one God to another. Jesus is sovereign. 
And that's why he calls us to turn away from the life that we are choosing to live for ourselves and turn to him and look to him and follow him. You see, repentance demands that we turn away from that life we used to live and we turn to follow Him. And Mark wants us to know that we can follow Jesus. We can do this with confidence. The question is not whether we can do it or not. The question is, is this reason sufficient? What if, what if there is no disease that's affecting you? What if there's nothing that's defined you? What if in your own assessment, you're good? What if you have no troubles? There are no demons plaguing you. What if you know everything? Should you still follow Jesus? Should you? Should someone who has it all, knows it all, been there, done that, accomplished it all, should such a person follow Jesus? Mark would say, of course, yes. Why? Because Jesus has the exclusive authority that belongs to God. You see, yes, it is true that Jesus taught with uncommon authority. Yes, he had authority over demons. And yes, he has authority over disease. And yes, he has authority over all that defiles. But that's not merely why we should follow Jesus. Yes, Mark tells us that Jesus' motives is pure. He is not in it for popularity's sake. Oh, he tells us that his method is gracious. That he does not say to us, you go fix your problems, then come to me. He steps into our problems and he touches us where we need to be touched. Oh, there is no questioning his motive. There is no questioning his method. But you see, that is not good enough for Mark. The reason why you and I must follow Jesus is not merely because of what he can do, but because of who he is, his identity. And so Mark continues in chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, and when he had returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And there were many who gathered together, so there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof from above him. And then we had made an opening, they let down the bed which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. You see, Jesus not only taught and operated with an uncommon authority, he had a different kind of authority. And that's what Mark wants us to notice. Jesus' authority was not of a different degree. On a scale of 1 to 10, the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders exercised an authority of 3. On a scale of 1 to 10. Now Jesus was going to exercise uh, 9 or 10 out of 10. No, that's a difference of degree. Mark's not drawing an attention to consider the kind of degree Jesus is exercising. A difference in kind, not a difference in degree. What he is saying is Jesus claimed to possess the authority that belonged to God and God alone. The exclusive authority of God, that's what we see expressed through Jesus. The first thing you see is when Jesus says to look at verse 5, he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. This man was a paralytic. He, he needed help of his friends to be brought to a place where he could receive healing. Yes, he has suffered much, but Jesus has an uncommon insight into the human predicament. He knows and he declares that sin is worse off than suffering. We 
We think the reverse is true, isn't it? Jesus is saying that sin is a greater problem than suffering. Jesus not only has insight into the human predicament, when he says, son, your sins are forgiven, Jesus gains authority over human predicament. Son, your sins are forgiven. You see, it's easy to say that, isn't it? No, it's unthinkable for a Jew. It's unthinkable for a Jew to say, your sins are forgiven, but it's, it's an easy thing to do. Uh, you see, the Jews were very uneasy with Jesus having said this. I want you to remember that Jesus did not go looking for anyone. He was at home, resting. Right? Everybody came to Jesus because they wanted to come to Him. They wanted to come to Him because he, His teaching was with such clarity and such authority. They never heard anything like this before. He not only was teaching with uncommon authority, He was driving out, you know, driving out demons. He was, he was healing those who were sick. Even if they were ostracizing themselves because of their uncleanliness, he restored them to full health. Jesus was in their eyes someone who could do no wrong. And yet, what he just said made all of them very uncomfortable. Did this popularity get to his head? Well, that can't be true, right? Because Jesus, if he wanted popularity, he would have just stuck around and, and he would have milked every opportunity. He didn't do that. What's happening here? Why is Jesus saying this? Some of the scribes were sitting there, they were questioning their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. They, they're literally saying to them, Jesus, you've got a wonderful thing going. Jesus, don't blow it. I mean, we're all here. We're listening to you. We enjoy listening to you. And we, we, we're glad that you're here because our sick are being healed. Please, Jesus, don't blow it. Don't become a blasphemer. Who can forgive sin but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in a spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Sins are forgiven? Or to say, Rise up, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise up, pick up your bed, and go back here. You see, if you pay close attention to that passage, both Jesus and the religious teachers had the same question. And they came to the same conclusion. Who can forgive sin? It takes someone with authority to forgive sin. That's what was deeply unsettling. Who does Jesus think he is? The Pharisees knew that it takes someone with authority to forgive sin. And only God can forgive sin. And Jesus is saying, you're right. Only God can forgive sin. Now let me show you that I have the very authority of God. And he said to the paralytic, I say to you, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God. You see, up to this point, it's fascinating, they say, Wow, we've never heard anything like this. Wow, this teaching has such authority. 
Who is this that the demons listen to them? Now listen to their exclamation this time. We have never seen anything like this. Oh, they've seen the demons leave. Oh, they've seen the sick healed. They've seen the leper cured. They've seen teaching with uncommon authority. So what is it that they're saying when they are saying here in public, we have never seen anything like this? Jesus demonstrated that he has the exclusive authority to forgive sin. That's why they've said, we've never seen anything. You see, there are many reasons why people can and do choose to follow Jesus. But there's only one reason why everyone must follow Jesus. We must follow Jesus with confidence and unreserved obedience because Jesus not only taught with uncommon authority or that he also had authority over demons, over disease and over all that defiles. No. None of these are as crucial as Jesus' authority to forgive sin. But who can forgive sin but God? I want to close with this and I want to say this to you this evening. If you have come to this place with Mark, there's only one conclusion that you can make. If you have followed the arguments that Mark had laid out, if you look at how he has portrayed Jesus, he begins with showing us that this was fully in line with prophetic expectation. Or oh, this was declared with prophetic power. Fulfilling everything that God has said that he would do, but yet define everything that you imagine that God will do. Because now God has entered your life and mine in the place in the place of, of Jesus. In Jesus, God has stepped into history. And you and I are called to pay close attention to who this Jesus is. You're called to pay attention to the authority with which he teaches, the authority with which he casts out demons, the authority with which he, he heals the sick and he reaches out and touches with compassion the authority with which he alone chooses to do all that he does and most importantly the authority by which he forgives them. The one thing that a human being cannot do for a fellow human being is forgive sin. That's what we got to do. So as I bring this to a close, I want to ask you this. Is that the kind of Jesus you're following? Because if you're not, there's a place for a course correction. There's a need for a course correction. If you are, then because He is sovereign, you can with the psalmist say, Ye though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are. I want to leave it for a time of questions, but before I do that, let's pray and then we can have a time of questions. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is so gracious towards us and that you stepped into our space in time, in history. A God who is most glorious and who has created all things beautiful has entered into the most ugliest of human experiences of human sin. And we thank you that you have forgiven sin. For who can forgive sin but God? And we thank you for in Jesus we have a Savior who saves us from sin. Thank you, Lord, for these, my dear brothers and sisters, who have taken time off to come and to, to 
consider what you're saying in your word and I pray that whatever is said here would remain in them only and only if, if it is of you. Whatever is not of you, I pray that you would toss it to the flames. But what is of you, I pray, no matter how little or insignificant it might seem today, I pray that it would take root in their hearts. It would grow and bear much fruit, for we trust that this is what you do by your Spirit. We thank you, we praise you, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we've got 15 minutes, so we've got time for questions. Pass, pass the microphone around and raise questions. Uh, as long as it's within these two chapters, I'll be happy to respond to them. The rest will follow. So. Uh, I just wanted to ask about the uh, Jesus Christ, while being alive, is able to forgive sins. I mean, I'm, I'm, I got surprised because all, I mean, how I understand that we are being saved because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that's the reason, the reasons, the, the very reason that Jesus Christ, and that Jesus Christ has to die is so that he can save us from our sins. But in this particular uh, scene, Jesus Christ, is able to forgive sins while he's still alive. Because we know that he is uh, the final sacrificial lamb that God requires someone to sacrifice in order to, for us to... Uh, anyway, that is just yeah. some kind of the... Okay, I, I think thanks. that's a brilliant question. Thank you for asking that. Thank you. Uh, you see, God has, and God alone has the ability to forgive sin. It works. It works. It works. Works. <laughs> we use that to see God alone has the ability to forgive sin, which is why Jesus pronounces that son, your sins are forgiven. Over here, Mark is not showing us how he forgives sin. He's only showing us that he forgives sin. Does it make sense? But Paul would write the same thing when he says about Abraham in Romans 4. How is Abraham justified? Now, we're told in Genesis, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. So Paul's raising the question, if Abraham lived before Jesus died on the cross, how was he justified? And his answer to the question is, God was looking forward to the cross and justified Abraham in history because he believed. Right? Our faith is in God. God is the one who justifies us. Now, God is both, and again, Paul says this in Romans, He is both the one who justifies and a just God. The question is this, can God say to you, okay, no problem, I forgive your sins. He can do that. No problem, He can do that. But will God do that? He won't do that because to forgive sin without paying the penalty for sin violates his holiness right so the cross think about it this way the cross is not an afterthought of God God did not think of the cross after we sinned both John and Peter says John speaks of Jesus as the lamb who was slain Peter speaks of Jesus as the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world which tells us that Jesus was already in God's scheme the sacrifice for sin. It happened in history 2000 years ago. So God was looking forward to the fact that he will in time pay for the sins of all of humanity and by faith in Jesus Christ we will be saved. So what Mark is showing us over here is that Jesus alone, because he alone exercises the authority of God on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus alone has the authority to forgive sin. Because God alone has the authority to forgive sin. But that authority is not abused by God, which is why we have the cross. God can use his authority any way he wants. 
but it'll be an abuse of his authority if he does whatever he wants. He will not violate his holiness because he wants to be merciful towards us. And so Paul would say, this time when he writes to the Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians 5, I think it's 17 or 20, towards the end of uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, God made him who knew no sin to become sin so we could be the righteousness of God. I hope that helps you. Yeah. I have done. I will use this so there's no feedback. Okay. Sure. Uh, I believe that we all agree that you know every verse is here for a reason, um, and you know some things just have to think about probably the background. But I was just wondering, verse 13 in Mark 1 says, uh, while being tempted by Satan, he was with wild animals and angels who were ministering to him. I'm just thinking, is there any significance why he was with wild animals? And, you know, Mark is the teaching? only one who says this. You can go and read all the other uh, synoptics, you will not find this. And there's good reason why, because at this time, remember, if this Going by what we had said when we started, that this is something that Mark was written within the first three decades of Jesus. This is between AD 60 to 65. Now what was happening in history at that time? That was the time when persecution was the severest before the fall of Jerusalem. Remember, going towards AD 70 is when Jerusalem fell. So this is around the time when Nero was literally dancing over the Jews and especially the Christians. One of the common and the most popular way of torture was being thrown into uh, cages with wild animals. So what Mark is writing is that Jesus has been there. That's one of the most reasonable explanations for that phrase. And no one else uses the same expression. Mark is the only one who puts it. You go and read the rest of the synoptics. You don't see it there. So yes, thank you for raising that point. So here is a principle that we can adopt. I mean, in as much as we read the text of scripture, as you're familiar with it, start learning to appropriate the background of what's happening in its, its culture. So when someone read, is reading this, you see the confidence that they have. Why do I trust Jesus? Literally, it's because he's been there. He's, he's been there. And that's why I said, if you remember one of the earlier things I said, being led by the Spirit does not insulate us from our troubles. It doesn't. Nor does it isolate us uh, you know, from our temptations. It doesn't. It is the Spirit who led Jesus into that scenario. So there is no reason for anybody who is a Christian, a follower of Jesus, no matter how dark their times. Now what would it look like? Think about this for a child to sit in the gallery and watch the parents being mauled by wild animals. It'll happen. Or for, for the parents to be there and the children to be thrown into the cages. Well, th this was the first century. This is, this is the price that was paid for us to have our faith today. <laughs> I'm not quite sure if we will be paying the same price. <laughs> if we were to pay the price, if we were put in a place where that prize was required of us, the gospel still holds true. This is a sovereign God who has interjected himself into human history. And for that we can be glad and have confidence. Thank you for asking that question. We have 10 minutes. So, two more questions, I would think. Yes. I recently read something about Nabil Qureshi working on dating the Mark, Gospel of Mark as well, and I think there's a lot of recent research going into that. Uh, if they do come up with something, is there any type of breakthrough that, that can prove something that might be very significant to the Islamic world, especially because they hold to some other theories of, uh, I don't know, resurrection, I mean, Jesus not actually rising from the dead? Well, the all the manuscripts we have today, the earliest copies, is comes from the second century. Right? 
uh, which means the earliest copy we have will be something like 100 plus. More recently, there have been some fragments of the Gospel of Mark that have been discovered, which were actually used as paper mesh for uh, mummies' masks. So they are the es excavations are being done, and they're taking out marks, and they they're finding that this manuscript, this manuscript that they found in this uh, mummy's mask, dates before the first uh, century uh, or before 100 uh, AD, which means this is the closest manuscript we've ever got, which tells you that uh, it really validates the, va the reliability of the text of scripture. There's no other manuscript, even the way it stands today, there is no manuscript, ancient manuscript, that comes anywhere close to the kind of chain of command we have between the original and the first copy. But this actually pushes it even further closer because it tells us that the manuscript we have are actually the manuscript that the first Christians themselves had. Well, that's incredible. So, yeah, well, that, that's, that's where it goes. And, and the manuscript that we've been working with, or at least scholars have been working with, uh, is the Gospel of Mark. That's that's a fragment that has been found. So, thank you for asking that question. There's one at the back. If the microphone can find its way to Olivia at the back. Hi. Oh. Yes. Is that working? I, yes, okay, in Romans, right, um, it stated that after Jesus has died, hello? Yes, um, you're all here. And, um, because of the, because Jesus has forgiven our sins. Wait, 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 hold on, hold, hold on, hold on. We have lost you. Is it out of range, is it? Check. Okay. Um, uh, you need to come up. <laughs> come up in life, Olivia. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, we can call now the Heavenly Father, Abba Father, because of the sacrifice of Jesus. We can now enter the throne of grace, right? And there's no more separation between us and Abba Father. So when we say in the context of Mark that Jesus asked the disciples to follow him, can that be read in the context of being disciples and not really the sons, as in we can't, at, at that time the disciples cannot call the Heavenly Father Abba yet. So there is a differentiation between following Jesus as disciples and taking our identity as the sons and, and mothers of God. Great question. Two things, uh, when the original followers of Jesus, uh, Matthew, Peter, John, when they were following Jesus, they followed him as a rabbi. That's how they followed him. They followed him as a teacher par excellence. They also recognized that he was the Lord, the Christ, the Messiah. We will come to that in a little while where Jesus in Caesarea Philippi asks Peter, uh, who the people say that I am? Uh, some say that you're Elijah, others say you are uh, John the Baptist. And then Peter is asked the pointed question, who do you say that I am? You are Christ, Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One. Now what's fascinating is following him for them meant he has the words of eternal life. John 8, where can we go from you for you have the words of eternal life. Now what's, what's interesting is it is that followership that then leads to them recognizing their sonship. Because for the Jew, they are sons of the Almighty. Deuteronomy says that. Sons you are to me, O Israel. Isaiah says that you are the apple of my eye. No one will touch you, says the Lord. So, this idea of sons of the Almighty is a very Jewish idea. That's the covenant. 
I will be my, your Lord and you will be my people. My people be meaning my sons. I have redeemed you. I have chosen you. You are mine. I have set my affection on you. Exodus, Deuteronomy. And it goes on and on and on. So when Jesus steps into the scene and he tells his disciples to follow him, they see him as the teacher par excellence. They see him as the Messiah. They see him as the fulfillment of the covenant by which God's reign will be established on earth. What they do not see is the Abrahamic covenant of it by which God says, through you, all the nations will be blessed. That's what they do not see. Because they're not yet in that place where they acknowledge it. Why did Jesus die? Going back to the question that we raised earlier. Why? Because it's not by the sacrifice of bulls and goats. You've prepared a body for me, says the Lord. It's by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when the disciples were following Jesus, this was what you would call progressive approximation. They were beginning to realize it all, which is why Peter always, always kind of put his foot into his mouth. Always. He was like, what on earth is happening here? One time I'm getting it right, the next time I'm getting blasted. <laughs> huh. Peter's just figuring this thing out. But when Jesus dies and he rises up, and when he tells them, you will wait for the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, things change. So when, now when they are writing, they are writing after the Father has fulfilled all that He has promised in Jesus. After the Spirit has been poured out. That's how they are writing scriptures. Peter says that no prophet writing is written of his own record, but they are men carried on by the Spirit of God, writing the very word of God, which is why you have the very assurance, the sure word of prophecy. That's Peter's argument. So when they are writing scripture, they are actually writing under the Spirit's leading, affirming the Spirit's work. And so when, when Mark is saying, remember he's writing an, an account which is validating Jesus, right? But he's writing as a son of God. Does it make sense? He's writing in the light of realizing who he has now become. And he's writing to a people who are appreciating that so that they can continue to do what they are called to do. One of the fascinating things is, if you look at Jesus, he says to them, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Right? Which is why almost every word needs to be unpacked. And I hope you go and continue reading this. Which Jesus says is that if you follow me, you will make followers of me. Which basically means if you come to me, I will make you my child. And if you are my child, you will be responsible to make brothers and sisters in your family for me. That's, that's what he's saying. That's, that's a blessing of the Holy Spirit. That's a gift that we do. So today, Olivia, when we come to God, we come to Him responding to Him as children, sons and daughters, because His Spirit is spread abroad into our hearts by which we call Him Abba Father. And that's a gift that God gives to everyone who receives Jesus because He has died and rose again from the dead. The cross and the resurrection has made it and open invitation for all who will come. I hope that answers the question. Thank you so much. God bless. And I will hopefully see you all again next Monday. Thank you.